as he posed it was, uh, can we bridge the traditional and the contemporary and still minister? And to that, I respond, yes, we can. I think that's kind of apropos at the moment. But I want to start by uh, saying that often what is typically representative, let's look a little bit at what is typically considered representative of the traditional and what is typically represented as the contemporary within black church frameworks. Um, particularly in the black church, it seems that hymns, anthems, uh, Negro spirituals are often cast in more of a traditional light, quote unquote. And then on the other side, you have gospel, jazz, and now even Christian hip hop that's considered more the innovative, the contemporary. And I think, it, particularly right now, uh, sort of the former in that group, the hymns, the anthems, and the spirituals, sometimes are, are cast as the quintessence of piety, of sacredness, and the expression of the divine, whereas the latter half, the jazz, the blues, the hip hop, is seen somehow often as being inauthentic expressions of the divine. And I think perhaps this tension, and again, this is all my, my take on it, perhaps this is rooted somewhat in these two issues of origin and purity. And I'm using purity as a descriptive category here. Uh, in the sense of origin, it seems that the former set, the hymns, the anthems, and the spirituals, often <clears throat> seem as if they emerge out of some faith tradition, whether it be the African uh, slaves or whether it be European <coughs> context, but out of some faith tradition, whereas the latter seems to be often rooted in what's considered the profane. Now, we don't really like that secular, uh, sacred divide, but it still persists today. And I think it really informs the way we discuss church music even right now. And so looking first at the matter of purity and the issue of origin with uh, jazz, I think it's, it's considered as being sometimes tainted or blemished and that it's not necessarily rooted in the church. And so often, uh, as an alternative, there's a growing sense of disengagement or a growing sense that certain folks don't necessarily belong. And the matter of purity is tied, it goes back really at, when you look at American history, uh, particularly in the early to the mid 20th century, when you look at sort of the migration of blacks to the north and a lot of these mainline denominational structures started to come in to their own. I'm thinking here in terms of like Baptist, uh, AMEs, even Presbyterians, all down the line. And James Cone takes a look at this um, in his text, Spirituals and the Blues, in which he, he discusses somewhat about how those who were on the margins, on the periphery, those who felt like they didn't necessarily fit in, in these sort of mainline churches, the blues became their form of spirituals. And, and the same thing I think is happening now, where hip hop, to many, is seen as their spiritual or divine form of expression. Um, and, and if you even look at Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's text on righteous discontent, uh, she goes on in terms of the folks who are considered more, how should I put this, high on the socioeconomic st strata as the politics of respectability. And she claims that, and it's pretty much seen that these folks represent a kind of European ideal or Victorian ideal of what morality is, what beauty is, what honor is, what civility is, and even what dignity is and what it should look like. And this started with predominantly black women in mainline black churches in the mid to, to well, in the early to mid 20th century. And it still even persists today. And we can see this even in the ways in which we worship now. There's some where you've got certain aesthetic things that ought to happen. Certain women have, I, don't, I don't love this actually, but the hats and the, the certain all black, certain movements that are still a part of the traditional and that persists. But at this, the flip side of that is on the one hand where you had, and it was really, I don't, I don't, let me make a caveat here. I'm not mentioning this to try and demonize or villainize what the politics of respectability side represents because in many ways it was a deep sense of utilitarianism. It was responding to the fact 
that you had blacks in the cities and in order to survive and to maintain and at least have some attempt it seemed at a decent way of life that then the blacks needed to sort of look a certain way, dress a certain way, and act a certain way so that we could assimilate in the culture and hopefully make a decent life for ourselves. And so that's, that was very much necessary. But the flip side to that, to the European ideals, was many often felt like they were subjugated. Many felt pushed away. And we all know this history, but they felt pushed away, and that sort of brought, led to a growing development of schisms in terms of classes within black culture. So you've got the emergence of the bourgeoisie and a growing chasm between the haves and the have-nots. Now I say all of this to say that I see these two strands, the strand of the politics of respectability and the strand of those who feel like they've been shunned by society more or less, still within the black church music tradition even today. And I think in, in, in large part if you look at contemporary gospel music now, and you listen to certain songs, and then you go back and see what churches these artists emerge out of, it's very much reflective of the doctrines espoused by the particular pastor or head bishop at these churches. And I think it's on two sides. It's more the quote unquote the politics of respectability, which is typically inclined with a more prophetic gospel, more social gospel. And then also on the other side, those who feel disenfranchised and are often, though I don't want to overstate this, more inclined sometimes with the prosperity gospel, on the other hand. Now, I hasten to say that I think the two can coexist, and I'm sure that they will because they've always coexisted in the past. When gospel music emerged, it wasn't <laughs> like it was the, the thing back then, and so that was seen as new particularly with the emergence of the B3 Hammond organ, and Emmett can speak more to that. But, <laughs> but is it enough, and this is my, my question I want to raise, is it enough to have typical music three or four Sundays out of a month, and then one Sunday to have Youth Sunday, which is also indicative of one Sunday to be innovative, or one Sunday to be different, or one Sunday that's an alternative to what you traditionally have. Is that a form of tokenism? Is that a form of saying, well, we'll just throw the youth in here for this Sunday, but, every, but nothing in terms of the innate structure and function of the church is really going to change. And so I raise that question, but I also say I think I'm hopeful in the fact that we can be innovative. And though I think we can be, I'm not necessarily sure the paradigms will necessarily change. Um, I've often heard people say, both in church and related to matters outside when it comes to leadership, that sometimes the issue isn't race, the issue isn't gender, the issue isn't ethnicity. The biggest issue they face is age discrimination. So when you see young people trying to step up, speak out, and provide you know, any commentary, sometimes it gets hit with resistance. And finally, now you can tell I'm a Baptist because I just said finally twice. <laughs> <laughs> finally, I want to make this point about. <laughs> finally, I want to remark that this discussion is being played out today when you look at the church pattern, church growth patterns, in the sense that, in some unique way, many mainline churches are suffering partly because they are of the institution and the traditionalism that's still there versus many of the mostly non-denominational non churches that emerge and are able to, to bring in folk because they're not necessarily tied to so much of the bureaucracy and the traditions that still persist in our mainline churches. And I'm actually saddened by that because I'm realizing in my 25 years old that I'm more of a traditionalist than I thought because I think there's so much beauty and so much richness and complexity in our traditions, no matter which denomination you fall into. And so I'm hopeful that somehow we can keep two of them together in tension, but not just to be tokens about it, but for the two to truly integrate into a more powerful ministry. Thank you.